Well, I want to start off this meeting by welcoming Tara and saying Happy New Year to Teresa. We appreciate the work that both of you do, and we know it's going to be a great new relationship here. So with that, please drum roll and start the reorg. Naming a resolution naming m and Bank of Cold Spring as the designa designated bank in which all town officers shall deposit monies for the town of Phillipstown. Can I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Vote aye. aye. Okay. Uh, a resolution authorizing the supervisor to, to deposit town funds in one or more now accounts, money market accounts, and or certificates of deposit, Great. providing that deposits allow monies to be available or come due in a timely manner to permit the town to meet its financial obligations. Motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Okay, the next order of business is a resolution compensating for use of automobiles in the performance of official duties at the rate of 56 cents per mile. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And aye. I vote aye. We're okay. falling behind the times with this 56 cents. It was 57 last year. Yeah, other municipalities are higher, but well, all right. The state, the state being released is that problem. So. Mm. Oh. Oh, <laughs> a resolution schedule. Oops, sorry, <laughs> a resolution scheduling the town board monthly meeting to be held at 7:30 p.m. at the town hall. Well, not at the town hall, but here at 107 Glen Cl Glencliff in Garrison, New York, on the first Thursday of each month, except when the same falls upon a legal holiday or due to extenuating circumstances, in which case the regular monthly meeting shall be held upon the following Thursday or such day as shall be determined by the town board at the regular monthly meeting preceding such legal holiday. You get a motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution declaring that items for the regular town board agenda must be submitted no later than the Friday preceding the first Thursday of the month. This never happens, but we'll say it, though. Can I get a motion on the resolution that sometimes we'll have the meeting items in on the previous Friday? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution authorizing the town board to hold monthly meetings at various locations in the town. Can I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. A resolution that the town board may meet every Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. at the town hall, which is currently located at 34 Kemble Avenue in Cold Spring, New York, to discuss and act upon such business as may come before the board. Motion on the resolution. Just so the discussion. We do occasionally do these at the um, building department, so that probably should be included. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So amended to include the building department on Cedar Street. Two Cedar. Yep. Two Cedar Street. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. A resolution designating the Putnam County News and Recorder as the town's paper of record and simultaneously all ne legal notices and similar items of information will be sent to the Highland Current. Could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. <clears throat> a resolution appointing O'Connor Davies LLC as the town auditors at an amount not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. aye. I vote aye. Next item is a resolution naming Supervisor Shea to act as budget officer for the town of Phillipstown at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Are you going to motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Next is a resolution appointing Susan Kenny as the assistant budget officer at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. I have a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Without Sue, we would be in dire straits. A resolu resolution authorizing Supervisor Shea to appoint Sue Kenny as comptroller at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. I'm happy to do so. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. 
Next is a resolution authorizing Supervisor Shea to appoint Ann Gallagher as confidential secretary to the supervisor at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Ann is a great help to me in the office and really this year has excelled at things. So my thanks to Ann with that. Could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. A resolution authorizing Supervisor Shea to appoint Maureen Etta as safety coordinator at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Not only Maureen, but both ladies who work at Highway are you know, just really great employees, and I know that Carl feels that way, so we really appreciate the work. Um, this extra duty that Maureen performs now is mandated by the state, so we do appreciate that. So thanks to Maureen. With that, could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution needed setting petty cash funds. Town clerk, tax collector not to exceed 450 at a time. Superintendent of highways not to exceed 100 at a time. Board of assessors not to exceed 65 at a time. Recreation department not to exceed 450 at a time. Code administration not to exceed 50 at a time. And justice not to exceed 200 at a time. Can I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. John seconded it. A resolution appointing Supervisor Shea as a voting delegate to the annual Association of Towns meeting and naming Town Clerk Percocello as an alternate delegate, delegate in the event Supervisor Shea is unable to attend. Motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Tara K. Percocello as Registrar of Vital Statistics for the Town of Phillipstown and that her compensation is the fee allowed by law. Can we get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Thanks, Tara. Next is a resolution appointing Allison Shea as aide to the town board at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Allison is a great employee and was a terrific addition to the staff here, so I'm pleased to reapp reappoint her as into that position. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Greg Warner as code enforcement officer and fire marshal at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Greg has been a big success story for us, too. Really super helpful. Next is a resolution appointing Robert Emmerich as deputy code administrator at a salary not to exceed the amount set forth in the 2020 budget. Bob is the, uh, the ultimate seasoned veteran. <laughs> so we're happy to reappoint Bob. Could I get a motion on that resolution? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Linda Valentino as clerk to the code administrator at a salary not to exceed the amount set forth in the 2020 budget. Tara, should we reappoint her? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like anyone who has any interaction with yes. Linda Valentino knows she is one of the most pleasant people and professional. Uh, so I'd gladly with that, I'd entertain the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Kelly McIntyre as recording secretary to the Planning, Zoning, and Conservation Boards. Uh, we're happy to have Kelly move over from the courts to take over this position now that Tara has left that and become town clerk. So with that, could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Susan DiStefano as clerk to the assessor at a salary not to exceed the amount set forth in the 2020 budget. Uh, motion on the resolution. So, so Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. I'm happy to aye, reappoint Stu's into that position. Next is a resolution appointing Adam Hotelling as Deputy Highway Superintendent at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Adam is a wealth of knowledge highway. Been here forever and really I know Carl finds him indispensable. So we're happy to reappoint him. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Maureen Etta as clerk supporting the highway department at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. And as I said earlier, Maureen is a highly valued employee and just has 
helped us and, and the highway department immeasurably. So motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Terry Fleming as clerk to the highway superintendent at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Again, one of the loveliest people you'll we'll probably ever meet. Terry's always smiling and a huge help at highway. So motion on that resolution. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Cindy Paraggio as clerk to the town justices at a salary not to exceed the amount set forth in the 2020 budget. Cindy has done a lot for our courts and we really appreciate the work she does, especially since right now she's doing it alone. <laughs> um, uh, but she brings, again, a wealth of knowledge to this <coughs> position. So with that, could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Mark Farlow as town historian. Mark's a great guy and a wealth of knowledge about local history, so we're happy to have him. And thank you to Mark for doing this. Can I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing James Loeb, Adam L. Rod, and Steve J. Gabba of Drake, Loeb, Heller, Kennedy, Fogarty, Gabba, and Rod, PLLC, as counsel to the town of Phillipstown to serve at the pleasure of the town board to advise the town board, planning board, zoning board, and handle special land use issues. Said attorney to be compensated at the rate of $175 per hour to represent the town board, $175 per hour to represent the zoning board of appeals, $600 per hour to month, per month to represent the planning board for general services, advice and attendance at meetings, and at the rate of $185 per hour for time to be charged to applicants' matters. Well, we couldn't have a better firm than Drake Loeb representing us, especially in, in, in Steve Gabba. I just really appreciate what he does for us. Yeah. His advice is always spot on, and I, I rely heavily on him as do all the boards. So with that, we're happy to appoint Drake Loeb. Could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Robert... Cinque as counsel to handle various litigation matters, including tax certiorari yeah. <laughs> yeah. litigation, yeah. and shall be con compensated at a rate of $150 per hour plus out of pocket expenses. Bob works for us at a real bargain rate. I've been working with Bob for 20 years uh, since she was with Richie Goldstein. He's a, a really good attorney and always always there for us in these matters so could I get a motion on the resolution so moved. second all in favor aye. aye I vote aye next is a resolution appointing Rob, appointing Robert Cinque as counsel to the town attorney to handle code prosecutions and advise code administrator officer at the rate of pay not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget as I said before Bob's a, a really professional attorney and we value his service could I get a motion on that resolution Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Tara K. Percocello and Joan Klaus as marriage officers. <laughs> huh. So the town board does that? I always thought that mm -hmm. you. All right. Could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. So. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution for Supervisor Shea to appoint John Van Tassel as Deputy Supervisor. You gonna take it? Okay. Well, I'm happy to appoint John. John has taken on a huge amount of responsibility, especially he and Bob with the uh, building project, and I really appreciate your help and your counsel, so thank you. So I'm glad to appoint John Van Tassel as Deputy Supervisor. Next, Town Clerk Percocello to appoint Teresa Crowley as Deputy Town Clerk, Deputy Tax Collector, and Deputy Registrar at a salary not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. I will gladly do so. <laughs> <laughs> and we all appreciate Teresa. Yes, we Thank do. you. Yeah. Another smiling employee. <laughs> <laughs> Next is a resolution appointing Mark Galezzo, Chairman of the Conservation Board. Uh, Mark this is what happens job. when so Mike, you yeah, no, Mark has done a very good job. His building background is excellent for a lot of uh, items that come up. He can really relate to it. He can offer a lot of suggestions, so I highly recommend him. All right. Can I get a motion on the resolution appointing Mark as chairman of the CB? 
So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution authorizing compensation for the Garrison School Crossing Guard as per budget allocate allocations not to exceed that set forth in the 2020 budget. Can I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. aye vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing the following to the Continental Village Water District. Ralph Bazignani, Supervisor. Diane Barton, Water Tax Collector. Steve LeClaire, Assistant Water Treatment Plant Operator. And Stan Houghton, Assistant Water Treatment Plant Operator. And Bill Rim, Assistant Superintendent. It's a good thing Bill has come up and that, uh, that Ralph got him to sign on for this because we do need, we're going to have to talk about, you know, succession planning here. I know Ralph's not going to stay forever and a lot of these people have been on these boards for... You know, 25, 30 time, years. Right? Yeah, wow. yeah. Long so, but we're glad to reappoint all of them. Uh, could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I vote aye. A resolution appointing Michael Fallon, Ralph Bassignani, and Vincent Sistone to the Continental mm. Village Water District Advisory Committee. Again, three people who have worked hard for Continental Village for decades. And, or, you know, in several capacities. Yes. Yeah. Right. And without which, we'd really, we'd be stretched to find people to replace them. I hope Mike Phelan is thinking about someone. So, but with that, could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. A resolution appointing Mike Fallon as superintendent of the Continental Village Park District. And Mike Fallon does a tremendous job as the super of the uh, CV Park District with the beach, with the dam, with everything down there. He's gotten a whole tennis host court, of volunteers, yeah, tennis courts, courts, everything. Yeah, so we really appreciate the work Mike does. Um, so could I get a motion on that resolution? So, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye, vote aye. A resolution appointing the following to the Continental Village Park District Advisory Council. John Sullivan, Frederick Romer, Tony Galfano, Vincent Sistone, and Ralph Bazignani. Again, <laughs> these guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah you got to have them for multiple spots. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> uh, the only people who are stepping up to do anything. Yeah. But uh, hopefully we can get some people interested in these positions. Could I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Happy New Year, Kim. Thank you. You guys started It's the reorg. Crazy excitement. Wow. Next is a resolution setting the recreation pay scale for 2020 as follows below. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Yeah. Seasonal employees, sports director and managers, seasons uh, 800 to 1800, youth assistants, between 11.80 and 18.50 an hour, adult referees and umpires between 15 and 30 an hour, youth referees and umpires between 11.80 and 18.50 an hour, scorer timer 11.80 to 18.50 an hour, equipment handlers 11.80 to 18.50 an hour, preschool and after school directors 12.50 to $40 an hour, assistants between 11.80 and 18.50 an hour, custodial between 11.80 and 18.50 an hour, and for directors and instructors, camps, clinics, and theater between 11.80 and $40 an hour, certified teachers between 11.80 and $35 an hour, youth assistants between 11.80 and 18.50, specialists between $20 to $65 an hour, park and facilities maintenance 11.80 to $20 an hour. I don't even know what the minimum wage is in New York right now, upstate. Is, is it 15? No. No. no, no it's not that yet. Didn't go that way. Oh, yeah. So we would obviously, yeah. I know for New York City it's one thing, but for yeah. upstate, yeah, it's a different rate. Why don't we put the minimum as yeah, the minimum wage? Yeah, put the minimum yeah. as the minimum wage. Yeah. New York State or New York State minimum, yeah, yeah. For, up, for our district. So with that addendum to the rates, we will be filing New York State minimum for our district, but could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. All, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution setting the 2020 hourly rate for part-time stenographers and part-time clerks as follows. Ryan Allen at the Recycling Center part-time at $16.50 an hour. Lillian Mosier as a school crossing guard for $20 an hour. Okay. Would anybody be opposed to us giving Ryan $17 an hour? No, that's fine with me. 
No. All right. Let's go to $17 an hour with Ryan. All right. With that uh, change, could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Neil Zuckerman as chairman of the planning board. Um, I tried to get in touch with Neil, but have, haven't had any luck yet, but I'm sure he'll accept the position. Um, Neil is a seasoned veteran and really has quite a resume for anybody who's ever seen it. So His we'd resume be, could be the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, looks that way. West, West Point grad. <laughs> yeah, so. And so on. Lots um, of yeah, he does have a lot of credentials, and he's been on the playing board for a good long time, and I think he brings a, a really unique perspective to the position. So with that, if I could get a motion appointing Neil Zuckerman to, as chairman of the playing board. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Robert D. as chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we just really feel good about Bob D. being chairman. He's very independent. Very thorough. <laughs> very thorough. Um, and a nice guy, but a, a very diligent guy yeah, as far as playing jo zoning board goes. His job is covered. Yeah, so he covers it well, and we're happy to have Bob. So with that, can I get a motion appointing Bob D as chairman of the zoning board? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Max Garfinkel as Wetlands Inspector and Natural Resource Officer. We are really fortunate to have someone like Max working for the town. Again, a really valued employee, brings a wealth of knowledge to this and, a, you know, bringing some youth to the position. Um, really just a, a great asset for wetlands. So could I get a motion appointing Max Garfinkel as Wetlands Inspector and NRO? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Next is a resolution appointing Robert Ferris, dog control officer. Uh, Bob's been doing this for a long time. Sure Whenever there's a problem, somebody gives him a call and he goes out. So, I mean, he's got a whole a wealth of experience in law enforcement, so that helps a lot. Uh, could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is Supervi Supervisor Shea appoints the following council members as liaison to the following. Highway Committee, John Van Tassel. Planning Board, Robert Flaherty. Land and Building, Richard Shea, John Van Tassel. Zoning Board, John Van Tassel. Conservation Board, Michael Leonard. Village of Nelsonville, John Van Tassel. Village of Cold Spring, Judith Farrell. CVPOA, Michael Leonard. Haldane School, Judith Farrell and John Van Tassel. Garrison School, John Van Tassel and Judith Farrell. Finance Committee, Philip Kotnick, Nat Prentice, Elizabeth Anderson, and Donna Padala. Recreation, John Van Tassel. Butterfield Library, Judith Farrell. And Information Liaisons, Judith Farrell. Right, is everyone willing to accept these positions? Well, yeah. Judy sure. was do doing recreation. Do you want to continue with recreation? I or? can continue if that's. Or is that. I mean, I have no, no, that's fine. Recreation is because I, I kind of got a load here. So okay. Especially yeah, with the I hear building, you. Building. So th with the change that. Uh, Judy Farrell will be covering recreation. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, Thank for all you. the work you do on these committees. Uh, next Liaison is a, positions. approving the 2019 holiday schedule, uh, New Year's Day, Martin Luther's King's Day, President's Day. Good Friday, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Election Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, and the following day, which is to be charged to Comper Vacation Time and Christmas. Would anyone be opposed to adding the day after Christmas to be taken as Comp or Vacation Time? Well, it's a Saturday. So. That's a Saturday this year, though. This but year it is. This year, this but year. the following year. Oh, yeah. I mean, I we just added in there for housekeeping for next year when we go through the motions again here. Okay. But uh, if people want to take that day off, I think they should have the right to. It's yeah. most, most of the civilized world does. Yeah, it's the most complex. <laughs> I, I don't work the day after Me Christmas. Either, so no. I had to work the day after. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bob. You can get a job work for a town of Phillips Town and you won't have to do that anymore. <laughs> of course, I don't think you'll be able to survive on the wages. <laughs> uh, so with that, 
Could I get a motion on the resolution approving the holiday schedule? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Could I get a motion calling the reorg um, adjourned? Sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. Oh, that's right. Oh, we have to add that. Who else are we going to go to? I mean, no one will have us. <laughs> All right. Can I get a motion to appoint Cecile as the video tech media specialist? Sure. Sounds good. Okay. So moved. It's a big title. Second up. All in favor? Aye. And aye, vote aye. Thank you, Cecile. You are our specialist. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. We're going to stand up and do the pledge, I think, aren't we? What time is it? I guess it's exactly 7.30. We are. <coughs> yeah. That's how we stage things around here. It's like the news. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome not only to a new year, but to a new decade. This is very exciting here. New decade, new decade here, and the Phillips Town Town Board still going strong. Looking even better a decade later. That's right. Right. It's going to be 20 years from me. <laughs> Approval of minutes, monthly town board meeting of December 5th, 2019. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Year end meeting of December 18th, 2019. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. That was a great meeting. Committee reports. Conservation Board. Okay. The, uh, the uh, Conservation Board, uh, while it didn't have an applicant, we uh, I kind of uh, tasked the group um, to take a look at our existing zoning codes as they end also our regulations such as chapter 93 which is the wetlands codes um, to try to part of what we're looking to do is you know big picture items uh, also as an educational obviously we we know that all of our boards handle applications as they come before us but that's only gears us in that particular area we don't we very rarely actually discuss the entire scope of what we're supposed to be doing in each of the boards and you know how that affects it and how we should also be tasking ourselves um, for looking at the town overall not just applications that come in so we're uh, we're reviewing those now taking a look at them see how we've uh, applied them in the past uh, how we would apply them in the future do we would they possibly be any recommendations we would want to make um, so that's that kind of discussion will be going forward so kind of task that having uh, no project uh, in between the also um, the storm as far as stormwater goes we are still working at developing the wetlands maps we want to have a good detailed mapping of the wetlands for our town it's because if any issues come up we want to be able to say yes we have these particular areas here not just relying on the applicant um, the other thing too is um, the, the group will take and the group by the way is uh, Max Garfinkel who is the wetlands inspector and Carl Fresenda who's the highway superintendent and myself um, we're going to take a look at the previous audits performed by the state in this particular area and review ourselves and make sure that our we're in full compliance and that we feel if we were to be audited that in fact we would pass and and uh and look at it from that standpoint i think it's a good idea for for groups to take a look at their programs from that standpoint and evaluate them based on the regulators okay and our next meeting is january 14th thank you mike recreation the Recreation Commission has a new member, Eric Cupper, who is also um, has a medical background, so will add considerably to the Commission's um, knowledge and also to the Recreation Commission's activities. He's already um, very enthusiastic about participating, and we welcome Eric to the Commission. The Commission also had a great December with the trip seniors took to the New York Botanical Garden and they loved the holiday train show. It was sold, the trip was sold out, and they came back very positive and happy, and um, 
delighted to have that experience. We also had a great, the Depot Theater had a great production of Elf Jr., which was well received by the youth in the community. The next discussion of community gardens um, is going to happen in the next week. There will be a meeting of the commission to just have a workshop um, to discuss the future of a possible community garden in Phillipstown. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Phillipstown Hub. <laughs> the Phillipstown Coalition met yesterday, and Danielle Pack McCarthy, the executive director of the Hub, facilitated the meeting with agencies from throughout Phillipstown and Putnam County, including our school districts and um, shelters and others, the Cold Spring um, Police Department and the uh, um, Putnam County Sheriff's Office was also represented. The Hub is planning another community conversation next Thursday at its office in Cold Spring, and the community is welcome. It's from 7 to 8 p.m. They invite all community members, and especially our youth, and the topic is social media. So um, next Thursday in Cold Spring is the next community conversation of the Phillips Town Hub. Is it a date? Yes, it's next January 16th. All right. Okay. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Planning board. Planning board. I attended the planning board meeting December 19th. A <laughs> um, few items on the agenda. Uh, we had a Joel Hunt and William Potter uh, site plan of 201 Hoog Road. I've been reporting on this the last several months. During the one to build a inbound pool, 20 by 40, uh, is on a little bit of a steep slope area. Anyway, like I said, I've been reporting this the last several months. Um, there was a public hearing held back in November. There was no public comment, and so the board approved their application at the December's meeting. The other item on the agenda was Daniel L. Scuba in Mini Fatato up on 359 East Mountain Road. I reported this on the last several months as well. It was supposed to be approved last month, but um, in uh, November. But unfortunately, Kim Connor had to recuse herself as she has done throughout the course of this process. Uh, so didn't have they could not have a quorum in, in November. So we had a quorum in December, and that application was passed as well. New on the new on business, Marzola on uh, Langate Road. Uh, the applicant is seeking a minor site plan approval for construction of an 1,800 square foot home, four bedrooms, single family residence. It will have a septic and a well. The property is approximately five acres, located in rural conservation zoning district. Langate Road lies along the scenic corridor, showing on the time the town scenic overlay map. There really wasn't too much to discuss at this meeting that, at this point. This is the first time the uh, applicant came to the planning board, but there will be a site visit scheduled for this Sunday, January 12th at 10.30. New on the agenda as well is Riverview Industries up in Route 9. Um, Kevin Riker, he's got that uh, couple garages up there. He works on trucks and equipment. Uh, he's a, the applicant is seeking a major site plan approval for a parking area across the street from his original uh, garages. The applicant owns and operates a commercial trucking repair and auto body business on two parcels located across Route 9, as I indicated, and this is an extension of that. The property is approximately 4.5 acres located in the Highway Commercial Zoning District. Also, there wasn't much to discuss at this one since it was his first uh, meeting. A site visit is scheduled for this Sunday at 9.30. Meeting was adjourned at 8.30. Next meeting will be January 16th, held here at the Rec Center at 7.30. Thank you, Bob. Zoning. Zoning board did not meet in the month of December. They will be meeting on um, next Monday the 13th here. Yeah, they sure will. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a long one. Yeah, the uh, national championship games on that night. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. college yeah, national right. championship. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll text you. That game doesn't Don't worry, I'll thanks. be texting you. I didn't really want to watch that anyway. No, <laughs> nobody wants to watch. <laughs> How about highway? Highway. Uh, Phillipstown Town Board members call for Zenda, work performed by the Phillipstown Highway Department for the month of December. Happy 2020. We hope everyone enjoyed the holidays. Coming off the Thanksgiving holiday, the highway crews began December with the first serious snowstorm of the season. A three-day event started with freezing rain and ice and turned into snow accumulation of 7 to 10 inches. All roads were cleared and ready in time for school for reopening on December 3rd. I think the crews worked 50-plus hours straight. Um, I mean, they, they did get breaks, obviously, but that was a long event. The remainder of the month, the crew spent most of their time regrading and filling potholes. Hickory Homes, a tub grinder service, was utilized to grind the overburdens 
of wood at the landfill. The highway department received approximately 16 phone calls, visits, or faxes regarding road concerns for the month of December. The highway department spent roughly $7,300 on vehicle maintenance and repairs in December. Carl Fresenda submitted that report. All right. Our thanks to the highway crew. Uh, they did do an extraordinary job during that extended snowstorm. It just didn't let up. So um, the guys really hung in there and did a good job along with Carl. So thank you. Uh, as far as building land acquisition, we'll be discussing that in the agenda. So that's the town hall project. Cemetery committee. Okay. Um, as you know from our ongoing discussions in the past, we uh, switched to the North Highland Cemetery to perform, which we did in the fall. We began some structural repairs because of the concerns of the actual um, topography and actually by not taking care of these problems early enough, we could end up having more problems. Uh, it did lead me to uh, go in and uh, review our other cemetery, McKeel's Corners. This is a landlocked cemetery at the corner of 301 and 9. Um, Years ago, what happened, and this happened too with a Revolutionary War cemetery, which became next to impossible to try to locate. Um, obviously, many years ago, people used land that they couldn't farm. And unfortunately, what they did was they put these cemeteries a lot of times in, one of the, in some of the worst places from a land standpoint. Obviously, they weren't thinking about what's going to happen hundreds of years from then. Um, but what's happening at McKeel's, at least in my opinion, is we're having some ground stabilization issues because they basically stuck a great deal of uh, stones up on top of a, a hill crest. And uh, we've already had two uh, stones actually collapse and fall down the actual hill. And it's very difficult to get in there because, again, it's landlocked, so getting vehicles or anything in there will be difficult. Um, what I'm going to propose to the cemetery committee uh, group is that we switch uh, some efforts with the stonemason to McKeel's Corners to, we're, I'll be walking that down with him to evaluate it, um, to try to come up with some answers, what we need to do. Do we have to add dirt? Do we have to, um, hopefully, not, not in the short term, but possibly small retaining walls? Um, and then possibly consider moving the gravestones over slightly because of their threat. Um, that may come down to being an issue that has to be looked at. Um, so that's something we're going to have to tackle in the, uh, in the spring, but we'll, we'll be doing some uh, ahead of work if, as long as the snow holds up, keeps away rather. Okay, so we'll be discussing some of those issues and others at our next meeting on January 14th. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Putnam County Legislator. Nancy was unable to make it tonight. On to the agenda. I did attend um, the legislators meeting in Carmel on um, Tuesday evening and Nancy represented us very well and really um, the meeting was reorganization and they were appoint making appointments to caucuses um, to committees and the one of the caucus met before the meeting and had predetermined some of the appointments so Nancy spoke up about that as well as other issues um, including stipends and um, she very forcefully was a presence at that meeting. Good. And so, she has been. Yes. Yeah, she's up against it over there. I mean, they're obviously working without her a lot of the time, or even contrary to things that she would like to see done. So our thanks to Legislator Montgomery, who does represent us very well at the county level. First order of business is a resolution authorizing Carl Fersenda, Highway Superintendent, to purchase a seven ton cam super line trailer in the amount of $5,901 as approved for the 2020 budget. Already with the machines. But we've got to have it. Again. Yeah, in an effort to keep modernizing our fleet and our mm -hmm. equipment uh, list. We do need to purchase things, so, and we do need to trailer things around a lot. This is a big town, 50 square miles. You got to tow things from A to B all the time. So, with that, could I get a motion authorizing Carl for Center to make that purchase? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution approving two proposed change orders for the town hall renovation project. Um, John and I. We're at Town Hall. You were probably there more than I was this week, but we were there earlier in the week to meet with the contractor and our uh, sidewalk superintendent, Greg Warner, to talk about 
things that are happening on the project and things they're finding. It's no surprise that we're finding other issues in town hall. Um, <coughs> one of them was they found some additional asbestos tile and obviously we had to have that removed so we don't have a lot of say in whether or not um, that's a unit cost so it was spelled out in the original proposal so he gave us the same unit cost. It took out 604 square feet of that at $16.97, including removal and disposal, which came to $10,250. Uh, it's not really going to be open for discussion because it, it, we don't have a choice in that. Um, the other thing is that they have to open some additional walls, perimeter walls around the building uh, that hadn't been anticipated. So. There's going to be the removal of the walls. Since they're taping the walls out, they're going to insulate, resheet rock, tape, and paint. And retrim the windows. Retrim the windows. Right. And then there's also one door that he's including in this right. price. Um, so he's got three sections on that. The total on that work, that change is $28,450. Between the two changes, or no, that's the total of the two change orders. Um, on this one, I did not total it up. But the total of the two changes is $33,946, which includes profit and overhead for the contractor. Um, John and I were there. We met with Greg. All three of us felt like there wasn't really any way around it. Again, they're finding things. We know there's going to be another change order. Where they went to put the elevator pit in, they ran into a boulder underneath Town Hall. Nobody could anticipate this. But that's where the hydraulic sump pit for the elevator goes. There's no way around it. He's going to have to bring in a jackhammer and hand jackhammer down to get that pit in. Um, these aren't things that are all that surprising to us. We did a lot additional monies. We brought in additional monies because we knew we would run over. Our contingency on town hall is running in the neighborhood of 30%. That's what we're expecting. Who knows if we'll get there, but that's what we have right now um, to work with. And the next thing, so we haven't received that change order yet, but we do have these two for the additional wall removal and the asbestos tile removal. Another one, not a change order, but an option that had been included as an alternate in the contract was removal of all the siding on the outside of the building. Obviously, we'll be doing that. We didn't approve it during the first round because we just wanted to see where we came in at a base price. But he did include it as an alternate. We're probably going to be approving that at a coming meeting. Because there's no way we can leave the siding on town hall. Everybody no. who knows that it's from the outside. It's got to be replaced. Yeah. But, um, so we have a number on that. We think it's a fair number based on square footage. And then also there's an alternate in that or a contingent in that on how much uh, of the sheathing he may have to replace underneath there. So because we know on the corners there's quite a bit of decay. And he gave us a square footage number on replacing sheathing. So we'll take a look at that um, at a coming meeting. It's not pressing right now, but these items are. So, I mean, John and I have had a chance to review them. Yeah, the architect and the, um, and the engineer, uh, Justin Caker and Mike Carr, were both there the other day as well. They looked at, you know, the situation and agreed that, you know, the changes need to take place. So, um, and like you said, we figured it was going to happen. That's we did. What, when you open up an old building, you're going to find stuff that you don't want to find. So, Yeah, now we know why we don't have a full basement. Right. Because the town hall is essentially rock. sitting on <laughs> ledge. <laughs> no, it's, but uh, with that, I would like the board's approval so we can process these. Um, we did submit all the documentation with them. We'll be looking for the certified payroll, though, to accompany these. Uh, so with that. Just um, the way the change order process works, the contractor submits it to the architect, the architect reviews it, and then he submits it to the town board for, for our approval. Uh, in the meantime, we've been going out there, and you know, because when this stuff pops up, they'll call Richard or myself, and we'll go out and, uh, and take a look at it just so we have an idea of what we're, what we're, what's going on. So. And we also have the uh, building inspector there every single day. Right. Greg Warner is the uh, clerk of the works, and he's on site every day. Every morning he's there, um, and if they need something, he's literally right next door, and he goes over. So he's been in contact with us as well. So. Yeah, and we're trying to keep things moving due to the time constraints we have. We would like to be back in the building in a year. That's not to say that we're going to, you know, be pushed around by anyone. If we find something that we think is out of line and 
but John and I are both in construction, so we know about unit pricing. We know what's fair and what's not. Um, but we do have serious discussions with the guys, so I think it's working out so far. Yeah. But with that, these two change orders um, represent a total amount. Let me get to number two. Total amount of $33,946. These are public documents for anyone who wants to review them. You can come down to the town hall and get copies of them. So with that, I was hoping the board would approve these two change orders. Could I get a motion on approving change order one and change order two for the town hall project? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. So the next thing on the agenda was discussion regarding the approval of the alternate of siding for the so town hall renovation. Yeah. So. We've had that discussion. We'll be discussing that further. Um, we're not going to approve that tonight, but we'll, I don't think we're going to have much choice when it comes to it. We did get a good price on that. This is the low bidder. Um, so far, I mean, what's your impressions of the contractor? I think Perry's up front. I think he's, I, I think he's um, a straight, front. straight shooting guy. He's interested in getting the job done, and he wants to do it right. So. Yeah, and he wants to keep moving because it's in everyone's best interest. You know, right. with, yeah, I met him. I think he's doing good. To get the guys and I there. think the key to his, his business, which he told me, he does schools. So he wants to be out of there for the July-August uh, period, which is a benefit to us. He's got his whole crew there working. So. He does. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll be taking that up at a future meeting, though. All right. Okay, next order of business is Ellen Weininger, Director of Outreach Organization, Grassroots Environmental Education, to give a presentation regarding municipal action on 5G. How are you? Certainly, yes, please. Sure. on yep okay very good um, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here this evening I'm glad to be back here uh, I was here um, uh, presenting to the zoning board a few years back on a related issue around wireless infrastructure um, I'll uh, give you a little background about grassroots environmental education uh, again, I'm the Director of Educational Outreach at Grassroots Environmental Education. We're a science-based environmental health nonprofit. We have uh, two offices, one out in Port Washington, Long Island, and one in Westchester. Uh, we are a small but national organization. I happen to do a lot of work across New York State and Connecticut, and I've been to the Putnam legislature as well as uh, Rockland and Westchester County, among many others. Um, we, uh, our primary mission is to educate the public about uh, environmental exposures and the relationship to health and environmental impacts. Uh, we work uh, with many medical experts and public health scientists. Um, and we serve local and state governments, school communities, uh, a variety of organizations, and uh, we also serve healthcare professionals in our work. Um, our goal is not only to raise awareness around certain issues, but we do create and uh, science-driven uh, solution tools and communication tools. So uh, this evening, I just want to take a little bit of time to uh, tell you about 5G infrastructure uh, and what that is um, and why this is so important for the town of Phillipsburg, uh, town of Phillipstown, I'm sorry, uh, to learn about it and, and what municipalities are doing and why it's so important to be aware of it right now. Um, 5G is a terminology uh, around wireless. It's the fifth generation of wireless infrastructure. So uh, while I generally don't love to do PowerPoints, I'm going to just run through a few slides because it really will simplify things. I do have some handouts that I um, have for each of you and also for the town clerk. And I'll also be happy to provide an electronic version. Uh, there's only one item, which is a booklet that does not um, 
it's not available electronically, but of course, any questions you may have, uh, we welcome them, not only this evening, but as follow-up. Uh, we're happy to provide as much support as possible. Okay, so um, on to the first slide. Uh, what is 5G? It's, a radio, uh, it's one of those um, generations of radio frequency microwave radiation. That's the technical terminology. Often you'll hear called RF, wireless radiation. Uh, current 3G and 4G technology that you're probably familiar with, given that there are cell towers in the in region and other kinds of uh, wireless devices, employ frequencies up to 6 gigahertz. Um, 5G technology is different. It uses short millimeter waves, and it's in a much higher frequency range. So sometimes this kind of gets a little technical. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but just so that you can get a grasp of the difference, it's in the ranges of 30 gigahertz upwards uh, of uh, 300 gigahertz. Uh, this is a frequency range that has not been widely deployed up to this point. So this is really new. Um, it will not replace 3G and 4G. It will be added on and uh, to the 3G and 4G wireless frequencies and infrastructure. So it's another layer. Um, this particular type of 5G, uh, you know, the millimeter and submillimeter waves requires very dense deployment. Hundreds of thousands of closely spaced uh, cell antennas because these are short wavelengths and they uh, do not travel well through buildings and foliage. So um, the plan is nationwide somewhere in the order of a million uh, 5G cell antennas. Um, and it means that, and you'll see as we go forward, that they're closely spaced in residential neighborhoods every few hundred feet, on utility poles, on lampposts, um, and so on. Uh, there have been no safety studies on 5G technology. Uh, I just mentioned uh, the, where these installations uh, would be, but right up close in your front yard, in your backyard, right outside your bedroom window, could be adjacent to a school or a play area. Um, and it is an involuntary exposure. You don't have a choice in terms of shutting it off or uh, lowering it. it is a 24-7 exposure. And that is different from other wireless devices like your cell phone where you get to control whether you turn it on, whether you have it near you, um, how you use it, whether um, you uh, carry it uh, away from your body and so forth. But it's, this is a, a whole other type of exposure. I'm just going to run through a couple of uh, quick photographs just to kind of give you an idea. It varies in terms of appearance. This is just one example on a lamppost, um, and different companies might mount a lot of different um, uh, cell antennas on the structure. So would different carriers have different? Potentially, yes. Could have a, on a multiple, one pole could have multiple Car yes. devices. Yes. Yes, um, but this gives you an idea, so it's not, you know, all cookie cutter in appearance. Um, here's another one, and it, I'm sorry because the visibility is not that great, but you see the top looks almost like a cylinder. It almost looks like an antique when you see it in person <laughs> is the best way I can describe it. Uh, but that's uh, the 5G attachment, but if you, uh, sort of move your eye down the utility pole, you'll see a small, uh, what looks like a rectangular brown box. That's a uh, distributed antenna system that is a 4G technology uh, infrastructure. So they, you'll see a lot of that in combination. So that's where you, you'll see the 5G layering up on the 4G. Um, this is right in front of a, a residential, it, right in the middle of a residential neighborhood um, next to a home, um, but we've seen them um, 
uh, you know, in literally in people's front yards, in their backyards. It depends on where the pole is. Um, we've seen them adjacent to schools, uh, right up against apartment buildings, um, you know, businesses. But there uh, is not this distinction between industrial area or business area and residential area. It's it's pretty densely deployed. Um, just to give you a little background about the Federal Communications Commission guidelines, current guidelines are more than 20 years old. Uh, the guidelines were established back in 1996, part of the Telecommunications Act. They're based on 1980 science, predating all of the wireless, almost all of the wireless devices that we use today in their current form. Um, they are based solely on thermal effects, heating up of tissue, but they do not consider biological effects. And that's, that's the big thing because current science, actually, as you'll see as we move along, actually um, shows a very strong uh, uh, association with uh, biological effects. Um, also, it's based on an adult male. There's no consideration about children, developing fetuses, other vulnerable populations. And when you compare the FCC standards to other standards from other countries around the world, um, the ones here in the United States are the least, among the least protective. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this, you know, point by point, but just I wanted to give you an idea of some of the other important factors that are excluded from these guidelines. Uh, the things to think about are uh, critical windows of development in children. We talked about unique vulnerability of children as they are developing. Um, the uh, simultaneous exposures of multiple wireless technologies, you know, given the fact that that's an exposure. You may have Wi-Fi, you may ha have a cell phone, um, you may have other devices that are being used. These are multiple exposures. That's not considered age, your health status, if you have uh, cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, um, if you have a, uh, a medical device that's implanted, um, that's not considered, and that's a very serious problem. And also our genetic variability and susceptibility. We're all different, and we respond differently. We're all affected, but we all respond in different ways. And of course, the cumulative impact over time. So is there any science-based studies or evidence, even anecdotal, that leads to this, to postulating these things? Yes. And I'm coming to that. Okay. Um, so uh, very recently, the FCC announced that they would not be updating their guidelines. This is just about a month or so ago. There's been a lot of push from the science community, from the health community, and public officials all over the United States, please update these guidelines and use the most current peer-reviewed, peer-reviewed independent science that is readily available that demonstrates um, biological harm and the FCC announced uh, very recently they're not updating. I wonder if that has to do with lobbying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this is uh, a, a great quote from one of the leading experts, Dr. Deborah Davis. She, um, she's worked for the National Institutes of Health. She is an epidemiologist, and I, I think it just bears uh, saying it out loud, as scientific research submitted to the agency shows, the FCC's 20th century standards were not set to protect from known biological impacts of increased and increasing 21st century radio frequency radiation. Would the American public agree to fly in airplanes or drive cars that adhere to safety or emission standards set 20 or 30 years ago, disregarding necessary improvements that could be made? And uh, this is a very powerful and very accurate statement. We just wouldn't let that happen. So there's your scientific evidence. Um, there are thousands of peer-reviewed studies that prove biological harm, including some of the things we discussed, um, neurological effects, reproductive problems, DNA damage, cancer, cognitive impacts. Um, I mentioned cardiovascular problems. Um, there are other serious problems, uh, electro uh, hypersensitivity 
We're seeing people who are complaining of headaches, dizziness, um, heart palpitations, um, and other kinds of uh, you know sleep problems, anxiety, a whole host, that's a whole other area that we're seeing when they are in the presence of wireless devices. Um, uh, most recently, and this is really, really key, the National Toxicology Program at the National Institutes of Health recently completed a 10-year study uh, that was around $30 million, and um, they studied the relationship between radiofrequency wireless radiation and health effects, and the study showed really the highest, you know, the highest uh, terminology that you can that you can apply in uh, a study, and it was peer-reviewed. It was a panel of about 14 independent uh, public health scientists and medical experts who reviewed that study and found that it, that study showed clear evidence of carcinogenicity from low-level exposures. Um, the renowned Ram Ramazzini Institute, which is based out of Italy but is funded by the United States government, um, and uh, they did a recent study that corroborated the study from the National Toxicology Program and found uh, clear evidence of cancer risk from far field exposures, so from a distance, not just from wireless radiation that might be in very close proximity, but uh, cell antennas that might be at a distance. The World Health Organization has classified wireless radiation as a 2B carcinogen. You can see it's in the same category with other exposures that we already know there are no safe levels of, DDT, diesel exhaust, and lead. Um, there's been an outcry from the medical community and the science community, those who have uh, published peer-reviewed research in this field and are concerned about the health effects. There are over 270 who have appealed to the World Health Organization and the United Nations calling for a moratorium on 5G and calling for stronger regulation on the wireless uh, radiation that we already ha are dealing with right now. Uh, we talked about um, the particular vulnerability, even though everyone is at risk because everyone is exposed. But you can see, as I mentioned, neurological problems, uh, those with cardiac problems, those with medical devices, and of course, um, the elderly and uh, fetuses, developing fetuses and children. Uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer reported children absorb 10 times more wireless radiation in bone marrow of the skull compared to adults. Their, their skulls are just thinner. And, and pound for pound in general, no matter what kind of exposure you're talking about, even a chemical exposure, children take in pound for pound more than adults do. Um, even the American Academy of Pediatrics has called on the Federal C uh, Communications Commission to update their human exposure guidelines um, without, to no avail. Excuse me, can you turn the mic more towards you? Sure. I wanted to be sure that you were aware that uh, the peer-reviewed studies have been done in connection with impacts on wildlife and plants and birds and pollinators, and there is a, significant, a very significant effect, um, and in particular, you can see from the point noted uh, that development and reproduction of, of these uh, birds and insects is of particular concern, and uh, we're seeing a significant impact. In addition to the American Academy of Pediatrics, you have the New York State United Teachers Union who have called for um, an uh, official policy around wireless uh, in schools. There's a, a, a large organization, Americans for Responsible Technology. It's a nationwide group that has over 100 organizations and community groups that have been very active on the issue of uh, wireless exposure and are particularly concerned about this rapid rollout of 5G. Um, and in fact, even the International Association of Firefighters are opposed to uh, installation of cell towers and cell antennas and infrastructure on firehouses because of the health concerns that they, uh, they have about this and that, um, that many have been exposed to when the cell antennas have been installed on the Firehouses. And if 
you need that official statement, you know, if you want it in writing, I'm happy to provide that. Or any of the other material. Um, other really key important things that have been developing over the last several months, just to give you some indication of, of how things are uh, rapidly emerging. Chicago Tribune uh, is known for their very thorough investigative reporting, and they did uh, uh, such a report um, this past couple of years, and it was released at the end of the summer, and it showed that 11 popular smartphone models exceeded FCC guidelines when they were tested by an independent lab following the FCC protocols. Exactly as it's done, it's a, you know, accepted, acknowledged lab, independent lab, and um, that uh, appeared in the Chicago Tribune. There was a lot written about it. Um, again, any of this, these materials are readily available, but I'm happy to provide it to you electronically. Uh, very importantly, the U.S. Supreme Court recently rejected the telecom industry's challenge to the city of Berkeley. Berkeley um, enacted an ordinance back in 2016 requiring that cell phone retailers uh, post signage warning customers about possible dangers of holding phones close to the body um, when the phone is connected to the wireless network and to warn them that, that the phone may be exceeding federal guidelines and the federal guideline exposures. Um, recently, very recently, um, and this is of particular importance to municipalities, uh, the D.C. Circuit Court uh, decision was that the FCC ruling uh, was arbitrary and capricious in its exclusion, it, its attempt to exclude environmental review for construction of mobile stations and, and uh, wireless facilities meeting certain criteria. So that would, had this, had they gotten their way, it would have excluded the National Environmental Policy Act, and it would have excluded National Historic Preservation Act. And I know those two things are very key in reviewing um, wireless infrastructure installations. So uh, thankfully, the D.C. court decision um, did not, did not um, go along with that and felt that this, was, this exclusion was not acceptable and arbitrary and capricious. Um, so what can you do and what is being done in, around the country? Uh, and that's fiber optic to the premises. Um, it's a readily available solution and um, it's faster, it's safer, it's more secure, does not pose a hazard to human health, um, and uh, certainly more resilient in the event of some disaster or catastrophic situation, but 5G is not necessary for connectivity or public safety. You don't need it for a cell phone signal. It really, uh, the, the context in which it is used is uh, for the internet of things, if, you know, um, driverless cars, um, you know, uh, appliances communicating to each other, these, uh, you know, downloading, video games and videos a uh, few seconds faster, but this is not about your cell phone signal. If you, and I'm sure each of you probably has a cell phone with you, you know you have cell phone service. It's not, and I recall that was an issue back when you were, when the zoning board was looking at a cell tower, a new cell tower installation, and there was someone from one of the local communities that established that there wasn't a cell, cell signal gap. <coughs> Um, and that's really important. So 5G is not really in there for that. It's in for uh, layers and layers of um, applications that are really not necessary for our day-to-day -day, uh, use. And um, you know, most people, maybe many people, may not even be using these devices um, like uh, driverless cars or appliances that have anything to do with uh, 5G technology. Uh, to give you an indication of what's happening worldwide, uh, we have countries like Belgium and Italy and Switzerland that are absolutely saying no and halting the rollout. Um, there are municipalities across the United States that are making efforts to protect residents and property values by trying to slow down the application process 
or halt the process. I mean, sometimes it's a matter of slowing it down until other things can happen to enable the municipality to have uh, more protective um, capacity. But a lot of that, as you know, has been stripped away by the FCC in the last uh, year or so, last two years. Um, many governments are insisting on a moratorium uh, of 5G and establishing a commission to study the health effects. Actually, New Hampshire and Louisiana enacted legislation to establish such a commission, and there is a bill right now that was in New York State that was um, proposed by Assemblyman Tom Abenanti. Uh, he's uh, an assemblyman from Westchester County. Um, I know the bill is being tweaked, but the plan is to introduce it during this legislative session, which just started this week. Um, Have there been any um, attempts are you aware of in Congress to amend the 1996 Telecommunications Act to take this into consideration? Or have you met with any congressional? Yes. Members? Yes. So Americans for Responsible Technology, as I said, is a very large coalition, and there have been regular visits to Washington, D.C. Uh, to meet with uh, members of Congress to educate them about this and uh, and to make them aware of the peer-reviewed studies, the concerns, and what other countries are doing. Um, Richard Blumenthal, Senator Blumenthal, um, uh, held a hearing, I'd like to say maybe late, late last spring, uh, where he had um, CEOs from some of the telecoms, um, and he asked them point blank, do you have any safety studies? And they all said no. And he said, essentially, we're flying blind. Those were his exact words. We're allowing this to be rolled out, and we have no idea. So we already know from these other studies that I referred to um, for 3G and 4G and 2G, we already know that there are bi there's biological effects. But the FCC is not looking at, the, at that, and the only thing that their guidelines take into consideration is thermal effects, which, as I said earlier, is heating of the tissue. It's, it's just not, you know, we're seeing in these studies biological harm at or below those FCC guidelines. So what I will be providing uh, you with among some of the materials is a model telecommunications ordinance. Um, I will tell you that it's not from one particular community. We actually um, put together kind of the best of the best. A lot of provisions that are offer more protections um, and I'll give you some, um, some examples. Uh, first of all, we have anecdotal information that shows random independent testing of wireless infrastructure that exceeds FCC limits. When engineers have gone out and tested, you know, you don't need any special, um, you don't need to wait particularly for a telecom company to come and measure, you can, you can just have an engineer independently test um, and based on those tests, and again, anecdotally, we've already seen that um, the uh, RF wireless radiation emissions from uh, some of the, that infrastructure does exceed FCC limits. Um, so what, uh, what this, one of the provisions is the right to um, institute a, a performance bond to ensure that the infrastructure does not exceed FCC limits, which are already deficient. And that would mean that you, ha you reserve the right to have uh, independent testing without advance warning to the company so that they can turn down the power and just independently test. And if the um, infrastructure, if the, it, this is if you did have an installation, these are some tight provisions, but some of these things actually deter companies from coming in and, and uh, going through with an application because these performance bonds can be pretty high 
Um, so who, with the normal cell towers, I should say the existing cell towers, a tower company comes in and applies for an application to put up a tower, and then the carriers rent space. Would it be a similar situation? Could or, be. Or would it be like each company, like the poll you showed, had five, five units? Yeah, so this is where it gets a little tricky, and I actually received something right before I left my office to come here. Um, from and I'm going to be uh, I'm going to mention it. Um, uh, it was from Western Springs, Illinois. It was uh, a community that received an application, I believe, from Crown Castle. But there were many different names on the application, so right. and that was uh, you know, and you could see in the in in the uh, municipal response to Crown Castle's application you know, that they decided, they determined that the application was incomplete and they cited about 20 problems that they saw in the application and actually, ultimately, Crown Castle withdrew their application because there were so many problems with it and one of them was Crown Castle was applying but all these other names are mentioned on various documents but not together in one place. So it's hard to know who's liable, who's who's responsible, who's the owner, and that's one of the misleading pieces around this. Because there's no structure going up. They're utilizing existing structures for these small units. Exactly, right. exactly. But these units can actually be quite large. Right. They really do vary in size. Some look small, but then, you know, there's this pileup that you saw. It's not the towers that we're accustomed to is what right, the difference right. is. Right, right. Um, the other is indemnification of the municipality. Um, this is really important because insurance companies uh, exclude coverage for wireless infrastructure. Um, you look at uh, examples, and there's been some things written up about Swiss Re and Lloyds of London uh, have uh, made statements, uh, but they have an e electromagnetic fields exclusion, um, and it's uh, it's an exclusion, it's considered exclusion 32, and the general insurance exclusion is standard in their, uh, in their documents. So uh, this is really important because if you were to have a scenario in which, God forbid, something happens and you have a resident or a business or whatever uh, filing a lawsuit, because of some harm, and the harm can come in many forms, and not just uh, in connection with some health effects. It could be some sort of hazard related to the equipment. You know, again, the way it's installed and it's piled up, um, you know, there are lots of things that can happen and that we've seen happen. Uh, the telecom company is not covered, and essentially that could mean that the municipality is held liable. So part of that, your ordinance uh, or your requirement is that the municipality is indemnified and is not liable. And that's really, really important. Um, so what I'm going to be giving you, actually I'm going to give you a few extra things, but primarily I'm going to be giving you um, an index to a compendium um, and that index is to the independent science on the health effects of wireless radiation. What that is, there are thousands of studies. I'm not going to give you thousands of studies. I'm not going to even give you hundreds of studies. But we have um, several volumes of uh, samplings of studies in different categories. Um, and you'll essentially get an index, like a table of contents, to our digest. I mean, you can look up the study. It's very easy to do that, especially electronically. You could probably click and get right to it. But in, at a glance, you really get an idea of what the effects are, um, because we know people are not necess necessarily going to be reading through 20 pages of studies. But the categories. Uh, that we have studied, uh, you know, the categories uh, in which we have made sure there are samplings of at least 10 or more studies include the effects on fetal and newborn development, effects on young children, brain tumors, parotid gland tumors, other malignancies, 
effects on DNA, neurological and cognitive effects, effects on male fertility. Uh, I mentioned earlier electromagnetic sensitivity, effects on implanted medical devices. We have some miscellaneous articles, and we do have now emerging some uh, studies on 5G effects. Um, also, uh, this booklet is not available electronically, but each of you will get a copy, and um, anyone can request this. Uh, wireless radiation and undeniable risk to human health. Um, this is literally a history of wireless radiation and how the uh, science emerged. And who knows about it? I mean, the United States government knows about it. The Navy studied it back in the 60s. This is all well established. It's all, there's all uh, these notations and references in here. And um, this booklet was put together uh, with physicians for safe technology. So we work closely, as I, said, I may have said earlier, with uh, many medical experts and public health scientists in an array of issues, including wireless radiation, um, and they're at leading institutions like uh, Harvard and Yale and Columbia um, and uh, UC Berkeley, all over the country. And uh, so we've worked with many of them to bring this to you so that you can get a better understanding of the full context. Um, and of course, the, uh, the model uh, ordinance that I wanted you to see uh, and have in your hands. And I, I did. I was able to copy that um, response from Western Springs, Illinois, um, the letter that they sent to Crown Castle in response to the application that resulted in the withdrawal of that, um, of that application. And it's, it's very interesting to see what they requested of the, um, of the uh, carrier. Okay. So. I, oh, I got a question. Sure. You Earlier, you, you you showed us that poll which had the 5G at the top and the 4G. Yes. Were you basically saying that they added the 5G and the 4G stays active? Yes. Yes. So, in essence, the 5G isn't really replacing the 4G or Correct. anything else. Right, that's what They're just saying. adding all of these. Right. Exactly. Okay. And that has to be higher than the other one, basically. The 4G was lower. The 5G's up top. Does that have any um, bearance on it, or did that was just physical that's choice? That's just okay. Yeah, I don't think okay. that matters. The way, yeah. Did any uh, any of the because we I don't feel personally we ever got a real answer to this during the cell tower issues, but the um, the federal law did anybody ever discuss why the federal government has anything to do with internal communities? Um, I can understand national security for internet internet. Uh, interstate highways, mm -hmm. military bases along those lines, but it, I don't uh, personally understand why they have any bearing on our community. We should be able to make our own choices here without the federal government. We're not even talking about the state government here. Does anybody ever raise those issues? And then, of course, obviously the outdated Continuously, war. continuously. Um, this is, uh, the FCC is responsible for infrastructure. Actually, the FDA is responsible for devices like cell phones. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a captive agency. Right. There was a study that was done by Dr. Henry Lai out of Harvard studying um, uh, all, you know, all of these different uh, peer-reviewed studies and looking at them to see what the differences are 50% showed a uh, biological effect, 50% didn't. But then when he broke it uh, apart and looked at how many were industry studies versus how many, you know, separated it out that way, independent uh, science, which is what you want, independent peer-reviewed science. You don't want the industry doing the studies and, and slanting it. And what he found that the breakout was that when he did it that way, 70% of the studies showed biological effects and 30% didn't. Hmm. So you can see, it's, yeah. it, unfortunately it is a, a captive agency yes. and, uh, and in the last couple of years there's been this major stripping away of local control, yes. Okay. So it's, it, yeah, we're, it's yeah, and we, yeah. we've been working with state governments, um, actually California uh, their legislature went ahead and 
approve that to happen. Mm. Thankfully, the governor said no. Mm. He vetoed that. But then the F it, when this started to build across the country, I mean, it, we came close in New York State. It was actually in the executive budget, buried in the municipal code, to allow the stripping away, the removal of local zoning for the cell antennas. And thankfully, when the legislature itself you know, got together with a one house budget, thankfully it, it did not stay in that, uh, in, in that code in the budget and was removed. But that's what was happening across the country when uh, residents and advocates and experts were getting wind of the fact that this was somehow getting through in, into and getting enacted or, or people were opposing it when they got wind of it. Um, and that's when the telecom industry got to the FCC and said, right. Okay, Ellen, we're, gonna, yeah. we're going to going at this for 45 sure, minutes. Sure, we sure, do sure. appreciate your presentation, but we have some uh, additional business to attend to. If you could give us the model ordinance, that would probably be the most helpful for us. Yes. Um, um, and then we can get that to our attorney and see what's possible. Yes. Um, and then the other documents you have. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. please. Thank so you. Well, if we can, can give it to us yeah, month, we have the other still packet, can't hurt to have it. Can't hurt to have another copy. Yeah. Thank but you. but thank, thank, you thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Um, we can take it after the meeting. Yeah, we'll get them out. Okay. The next item on the agenda is to schedule workshops or meetings. So the next monthly town board meeting is February sixth. We're not going to schedule anything right now unless somebody has something pressing. Well, I think we should get. Perry the information for the quote for the um, alternate alternate one and maybe we can meet next week because I think it's going to well we could have a special daytime meeting for that we could yeah yeah so right. let's I got to get back with Sue tomorrow if there's some things he's got to start providing to us okay. including the certified payroll in order to get paid I think the quicker forward. we get him that answer the easier his job's going to be and it's going to proceed faster yes yeah, so we could meet, you know, any, any day next day. week. Okay. Get three I'm, I'm, together. I'm around a lot next week. All right. Um, code enforcement. Code enforcement monthly report for December 2019. Fees collected $13,379. Total number of permits issued 29. Additions, alterations, or repairs to residential buildings, one. All other permits, pools, sheds, decks, plumbing, HVAC, 28. Number of certificates of occupancy, 19. Inspection of public assembly, 1. Inspection of commercial occupancies, 2. Um, and projects of significance, obviously, are the town hall res renovations have begun. Nice. Our own way. Can you pay our own? Do you have no. Permit? no. <laughs> <laughs> and for the village of Cold Spring for the month of December 2019, uh, fees collected $1,357.60. Total number of permits issued six. Additions, alterations, or repairs to residential buildings three. Additions, alterations, or repairs to commercial buildings two. All other permits, pools, sheds, decks, plumbing, HVAC, etc. one. And number of certificates of occupancy five. All right, thanks to Greg Winter. Um, turns out we will be staying on with the Village of Cold Spring. Good. So I think they recognized the fact that you know, we are providing them good service, good. and good. when they went looking around, they were able to figure that out. Um, but we, are get, we do have an assistant that we've hired to Greg. He's going to be handling a lot of fire inspections and then giving you great hands, a hand in any area where he feels like he needs it, so. Yeah, he started uh, Monday, I believe it was, yep. or Tuesday. Yeah, I met him. So that'll, that'll take some of the load off of Greg with the fire inspections, but like Greg and I and, and Mayor Mirandi had a productive, if not contentious meeting, but um, I think we walked out of the room with a better understanding of what everyone is gonna require and what's possible. Mm -hmm. So. That's good. That was good. Anything else from the audience? Yes, Michelle. Is your Pardon me? Is your yes, it is. Hi, 
Michelle Smith from Hudson Highlands Land Trust. A um, couple of things. Uh, I wanted to introduce you to our new manager of community engagement, Ashley Rouse, who Hello, many of you everybody. know. Hello, um, she uh, will be um, taking the lead on a lot of our municipal work. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quick update on the water project because I know some of you volunteered to help us with the water quality testing. Um, we don't actually have the results yet. They go into the lab in winter and I don't think we were number one on their list to get the results out. So they've told me February, so hopefully we'll have the results by February. Um, we actually just came from the Phillipstown Climate Smart Task Force to update them on a couple of projects we're working on. One of them is uh, one that you signed a uh, letter of support for last year for the connectivity project. So we're doing some connectivity planning, which is basically building green corridors for both recreation and wildlife um, in Phillipstown and Putnam Valley. So we got a grant, we were just awarded a grant from the DEC Astro program for that. So thank you for your support. Um, and we will be working closely also with the Climate Smart Task Force and sharing the maps that we come up with with them as they do their natural resource inventory. We'll also be sharing, we've got a bunch of maps that have come out of the water project on priority parcels that are important to the Clove Creek Aquifer watershed as well as the Foundry Brook watershed. So we'll share that um, for the natural resource inventory work that the Climate Smart Task Force is doing. And then the next step of our water project is we really want to understand how decisions get made about drinking water, whether it's well water or municipal water throughout the whole town of Phillipstown. I know there's a bit of a mishmash of uh, different water suppliers, including private and municipal, uh, across the town. And so we've started a survey, which you all will have received, and may, many people in the audience may have also received it, just to understand the decision-making process around water, we're partnering with the Nature Conservancy. I'll let Ashley just give it a quick, you know, couple of minutes uh, update on what that partnership looks like. But really, we we have an objective to ultimately come up with some sort of functioning water coalition of stakeholders and people who are really interested in water issues. Um, that will be a central repository for information about water issues in the town and the village. Um, and also hopefully functionally can uh, take action on water issues as they arise. So with that, I'll let Ashley introduce herself a little bit and also just give a couple of minutes update on the survey we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. Hello everybody, very happy to be here tonight and looking forward to working with you more in the future. I know many of you are already on the board. Um, to give you a little background on myself, um, I've been with the Land Trust for about two years now, previously our Outreach and Events Manager, and as of January 1st, I'm now our Community Engagement Manager, taking on a broader public policy role. Um, I just want to touch on a little bit our, our water survey, Michelle already introduced it. Um, we, to build this water coalition, which is our goal, uh, we're doing three things to get there. Um, first, we have launched this survey, which, like Michelle said you should have received in the ma in your email. If you haven't, please let me know. Um, that was sent out a couple of days ago. It closes in about two weeks. Um, we would love your input on that, so we're trying to assess two things. What are the main I water issues that people care about, and who are the people that they go to when these water issues arise? Um, so obviously that is going to help inform who should be part of this coalition that we are trying to build. So once we have the results of that survey, we will gladly share them with you. That should be sometimes in the month of February. After that, we're going to be hosting, or the Nature Conservancy will be leading something called a water leadership training. Um, and that is for key stakeholders to learn to c how to work together around different water issues as they arise in a community. And then the third approach is going to be a more targeted um, water uh, Co the, the, it's the launch event for our coalition, which will be um, a convening, a more targeted convening um, that comes out of the, the leadership training. So we will keep you posted on that. That should happen sometimes between now and April or May. Um, and with that, just uh, please, I encourage you all to fill out that survey. If you don't have the link, please let me know. Same in the audience. If you're interested in filling it out, please let me know. Um, and we look forward to sharing the results with you. So thank just you. Thank you. you think right. that, that two weeks is going to be enough time to get enough people to respond to that? We hope so. So it went out to just uh, over 200 people. Um, oh, that's it? Just 200? 200 people. And then we've already got received 30 or so. Yeah, I did. Um, you I did. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, we've already received 30 or so responses, which is a pretty good survey response 
outreach okay. so far. So, um, and we're going to continue our outreach over the next two weeks. So. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't want to get cut short and not give you enough results. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ed. <coughs> section of South Mountain Pass uh, in Route 9D. Uh, my house is just up the road from the intersection. And um, I'm wondering what steps the town is going to take uh, to move forward with this project. Well, it's in this year's budget to uh, improve the intersection there and also to pave it from 9D up to the pave section of South Mountain Pass. So it's been, it's in the highway budget. Um, the highway super obviously has plans for it. So I mean, if you wanted to ever meet directly with him, I'm sure he would, you know, come out and walk you through it. So if you gave the highway department a call, talk to Carl, he'll come out to that, you know, location and meet you there and walk you through the program. I was wondering if you were going to contact the state. I'm sure he'll have to contact the state since we're intersecting with a uh, state highway. Um, would the, could the town board uh, write to the state a letter uh, asking the state for their help uh, with the um, construction or the planning of the intersection? Well, I'm, uh, currently I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's been done like that. If the highway super feels that's necessary, then we would back him up on that. But, you know, highway work is his purview. So... Yeah, he, well, that, that's where it would come from. If he writes that letter, or if he feels that's necessary, then obviously we would, you know, gladly back him up on that. Well, I think it's I think it's the town board's responsibility um, to write this letter um, to the state and ask them for their help and input uh, with this project. I mean, after all, the two people that are uh, paved the roads, mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I, well, we, I, don't, we don't pay the road. The highway superintendent makes that, suggestions to us which roads he thinks should be paved, and then we either fund that or we don't fund it. Yeah. But well, this year we did fund that project. But, but I'll, I'll speak to Carl tomorrow, and you'll see what his feelings are there. Yeah, I would, I would like, to, uh, like you to um, get that letter started up to the state um, and um, uh, make it... Um, make it addressed to um, uh, traffic safety, traffic safety group. Um, what they'll do is come down and study, study that intersection because um, um, this intersection is going to be a big project. And uh, it, needs, it needs input from the state um, design-wise and um, f from the town. Yeah, anything we do there, we would have to submit to New York State. Yeah, yeah, well, they got plans, they're engineers, and so forth. Mm hmm As do we. Okay. Um, another, another thing I'd like to see you do is write uh, my neighbor, Mike Kelly, and make him aware of what's going on there because his property abuts that intersection. And uh, I believe it would be good uh, a community... Uh, effort on your part to, to get him involved because uh, without his uh, knowledge of, of what the town is going to do, um, he needs to be in, involved because it's his property and um, uh, he, to make this intersection properly, it needs to be moved south mm -hmm. and, um, and that's where his property is. So um, uh, he should be on board from, from the get-go saying what's going on with the state and uh, uh, what, what's going to happen and so forth. All right. Well, and, and I would also um, uh, like to ask the board members to take a ride down there and, and look at this intersection. Uh, now that they, uh, you may have before, but now is a good time uh, to look at it uh, without the leaves on and so forth. And um, you'll see that there is 
um, a good spot for it. Um, if you look through the woods, you see a perfect spot right down to 9D where the grade um, off of South Mountain Pass and onto 9D would work very smoothly. Um, so it's without Mr. Kelly's um, help, um, this intersection is is not going to turn out properly. So he's he's a, he's a key man uh, with this project. So he needs to be he needs to be updated and what kept in the kept in the loop. Um, so you know uh, you know if the the town could acquire some of his property, it would be great uh, to make this work because this. Um, this intersection is going to be there for a long time. It needs to be done right. And uh, uh, there's a lot of traffic on the pass anymore. There's a lot of traffic on 9D. So the design uh, and the safety factor uh, needs to be looked at. Oh, um, and um, I'm sure, I'm sure there's going to be some controversy over this intersection. I mean, look at the controversy you had with paving South Mountain Pass. What I, re you, I remember that. What you had to put up with to get to get the roads <clears throat> paved. So um, um, you may expect uh, some controversy about making uh, this intersection not as conspicuous as it could be to keep traffic from. Uh, using the intersection, but uh, um, it should be uh, set up properly to make it comfortable for traffic in and out. Uh, as it is now, uh, if you people take a ride down there, you'll see um, it's almost a it's a hairpin turn going north, making a right hand turn onto the pass, and and the great difference there, uh, without moving it further south, is going to be uh, it's not going to work properly. So if you could remember to write that letter to the Poughkeepsie in care of um, traffic and safety group, um, it's like uh, any of their intersections, they, they have a record of what's going on there and uh, accidents and uh, different other things that go on there. And uh, I'm sure that they, they'll be helped helpful with their engineers um, in the design process. I don't know Mr. Kelly's address, but I have his phone number if you're interested. Sure. Um, it's 845-424-3515. Mm -hmm. He lives off of uh, Route 9, um, just south of Travis Corners Road. Um, his property um, he has a rental person in the property uh, there. So, um, um, as I say, without his help, um, it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll speak to the highway support tomorrow. Well, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. This Ed. is going to be quite an improvement for the town yeah. um, to get that intersection um, um, done right. And um, I hope the best of luck to the town for uh, getting this project finished and, and, the, inter and the intersection brought up to um, today's, uh, with today's traffic and, and what is he supposed to be used for? I mean, it's, a, it's an intersection. It's not, a, it's not something that um, should be built. Um, on a small scale, it needs to be handled. Two-way traffic in that intersection and, and comfortable for the people um, that are using it. All right, thank you, Ed. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Sorry, one little point that I meant to mention, but very important. Um, there are actually many towns and villages that are actually s rejecting applications uh, just saying no, and I wanted you to be aware of that. Um, there are a, a bunch of towns out on Long Island in Nassau County, uh, Manor Haven, Plandome, 
uh, Lake Success, uh, Flower Hill, um, the town of North Hempstead, which has 17 municipalities, which is quite large, one of the largest in the state, uh, they are also, they've decided to just say no to uh, applications that have come in and outright reject them. And uh, my understanding is that in the event that you should decide that you'd like to speak with any of the attorneys or municipal officials from those communities, they are available and accessible, and I'd be happy to arrange um, uh, an introduction, and you know, by email or by phone or whatever you need. Thank you. Have ordinances already? Those towns that are uh, whether they already have telecom ordinances in place, uh, they have been receiving applications for these installations, and they've just outright said no. Well, it's in essence a moratorium, so. Thank I had you. made a note about that. I did see yeah. the slide with those communities yes, on it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Apologies Thank for not mentioning it. Thank, well. Thank, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Vacancies. Recreation one. Playing playing That's board. Filled. That's filled. Is it's it? Filled okay. We can cross that off. Sorry. Playing board one. Playing board one, right. So we're going to have to. Did we advertise for that yet for playing board? I don't think so. So let's advertise and we'll, we'll uh, interview some people. Approval of vouchers, general. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. aye vote aye. Highway. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote aye. Continental Village Park District. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. aye. Continental Village Water District. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote aye. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 aye vote aye. Done.